Good, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on your time zone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Fiber Channel Industry Association's FICON 201 webcast. This is uh, the second educational webinar in the series. Uh, my name is Joe Kimpler, and I'll be your moderator today. Uh, a PDF of the slides will be posted to the FCI website for reference material or for you to share with your colleagues afterwards. Today, um, you see our pictures. We have an all-star cast from IBM. We have Patty Driver. Patty, would you like to say hello? Hi. Hi. And Hi. Patty's co-presenter will be Howard Johnson from Broadcom. Howard, would you like to say hello? Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, webinar. Again, this is Joe Kimpler. I'm from Addo, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, just some housekeeping. As a moderator, I'll be taking questions during the presentation, and we'll be interjecting them via chat. Uh, to our presenters, and we'll answer them as soon as possible. Uh, if I don't have a chance to ask the question because they're in midstream, then we'll, I'll try to catch up during a break. And or if we have too many questions, what we'll do is we'll get all the questions, summarize them, and post them on a blog afterwards. So with that, um, I'd like to go over the agenda. Uh, we're going to do a brief review of the relevant uh, FICON 101 concepts. This is for the people who happen to miss the first one. Then we'll do the mapping of the FICON onto the Fiber Channel Layer 2, the evolution of FICON and uh, protocol optimizations, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Again, anytime you want to ask a question, go ahead and type it in the chat box. I'll do my best to interject it with the presenters. If we can't get to all the questions, we'll post them on the blog afterwards. So with that, um, with for a brief, brief review of FICON 101, I'll turn it over to Patty. Okay, thanks, Joe, and thanks, everybody, for joining and listening in. We're going to cover a lot of information in this hour, but we'll try our best to make it digestible for you. So when we did FICON 101, Howard devised this acronym, this is faster. It's really an excellent way to summarize the characteristics of the mainframe and everything that drives the design of the mainframe. Uh, those attributes are there because financial institutions, large retailers, government, um, and many, many more industries put their trust in the mainframe to host their mission-critical data and perform transactions against that data. Virtualization really began with the mainframe. And its capabilities are in the level of virtualization are unsurpassed. Howard, do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you, Patty. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out uh, that uh, may not be exactly evident in the picture, the different levels of virtualization that the mainframe has. The first one is at the uh, hardware level. Essentially what happens is the mainframe is completely virtualized the hardware so that all of the layers above it believe that they're actually running on the machine all to themselves. The, uh, that is manifested in uh, various partitions. And then secondly, the partitions themselves can be further virtualized uh, with a hypervisor put in place that allows multiple operating systems uh, to be loaded into a single partition. And that further uh, expands the um, capacity uh, of the mainframe and also the flexibility of the mainframe. And then lastly, I wanted to point out that the um, Partitions themselves have this ability to share physical resources between uh, each of the partitions. So, for example, the I.O. paths can be shared between multiple partitions, even though the partitions have no idea that they are sharing those, those particular resources. And that increases the efficiency of, of uh, the mainframe and mainframe solutions. So those three items right there, I think, separate the mainframe um, uh, from any other transactional processing solution. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Howard. Um, and you know, the acronym is faster. Um, I liked it in particular because performance is key. And one of the strengths of the mainframe is the I/O subsystem in that it allows a massive amount of parallel work to be performed. And obviously, the I/O subsystem is what we're going to talk about today. So hopefully, you listened to FICON 101. But there are a couple of things that we went over there that we're going to refresh today to, uh, in order to move forward into the future topics. So a refresher on how I.O. is performed. A start subchannel processor instruction is executed, and that instruction identifies the target device, known as a subchannel in mainframe lingo. 
and it points to a parameter called the operation request block. This orb, as we call it, points to a single command, or you see it could be a series of commands to be executed, along with the address of where the data resides or should be placed in host memory, a count of data relevant to that address, and then a set of control flags that guide the execution of that command or the command chain. And once the start subchannel instruction is issued, the processor is free to go off and do other work. And now the I.O. subsystem takes over. <clears throat> In FICON 101, we talked about two layers of mainframe architecture that are relevant to FICON, the system architecture and the link architecture. The link architecture describes behaviors You'll notice on both sides of the link, the host side and the storage controller side, or in FICON terminology, what we say, call the control unit side. The link architecture layer is the layer that converts the mainframe system architecture constructs of things like CCWs, like we just looked at, and on the storage controller side, the extended count key data device architecture to constructs that fit the transport in the middle, and in this case, we're talking about fiber channel. So all the particulars of link initialization, link level functions defined in the fiber channel standards, both at the FC2 layer and um, some FC4 specific FICON link functions, and all the link error detection and recovery, those are all the work of this link layer. So with that refresher of some of the concepts we introduced last time, we're going to go a little bit deeper this time into how FICON as an upper level protocol maps onto fiber channel. So FICON is known in fiber channel standards as FCSB for single byte. <clears throat> What's important to note here is the physical transport comprised of those FC0 through 1 layers on the right side. Uh, is agnostic to the upper level protocol, the FC4 layer. Uh, it builds out something called, uh, it builds, the FC2 layer builds frames out of something called information units that the upper level protocol builds and passes to it. And similarly, the upper level protocol, in this case FICON, is not aware of how the IUs it builds are going to be decomposed into fiber channel frames. That's what the job of the transport is. Um, as Howard likes to say, FICON, though, is more than just an average upper-level protocol. It's a state of mind. Right, Howard? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, certainly in, in my experience in uh, becoming familiar with FICON, it was more than just understanding the protocol and, and getting things to work. Um, the underlying uh, physical transport must su uh, support all the characteristics that are listed in our is, is faster uh, uh, mnemonic. Um, and so when we made this transition from SCON to FICON, many of the characteristics uh, of fiber channel were rigorously evaluated and then, and in some cases modified, in order to support uh, all of those features, essentially creating a FICON state of mind um, out of fiber channel. Yeah, and as Howard said, on the left side, you can see how FICON was an evolution from SCON, which was standardized as the original FCSB. But the first true mapping onto the fiber, tra fiber channel transport was SB2, uh, with, where what's known as FICON command mode, or the original FICON, was first defined. And each subsequent release that you see there of the standard provided new feature functions, a few of which are listed there. Uh, and a few of which we'll talk about today. But all of them helped in some way advance those attributes that we described in, in the is faster acronym. So let's look at the mapping. So an information unit, we'll start with that. And this is the construct that's defined in the FCFS standard that facilitates the mapping of an upper level protocol, the thing at the FC4 layer, to fiber channel sequences and frames at the FC2 layer. You can see the definition there. It, it's described in the standard as an organized collection of data <coughs> that's specified by the upper level protocol. So what SB specifies in this regard, or what FICON specifies, are IUs to pass command, status, data, uh, control information about one of those things, or information about unique 
uh, SB link operations. At the SB2 layer, these things look like device data frames, that's based on the setting in the R control field, and the FICON command mode operations use five of the FC2 layer defined information categories that you can see noted there on the slide. So those R control and information categories are what's specified in the FC2 header of the frame that is constructed. So I think it's good to keep going back to the beginning and moving forward. So starting back at the beginning and following the sequence of events to something being sent on the link, the starts of channel instructions issued, as we talked about, with all the information about which device is the target, whether it's a read or a write, uh, the host address or addresses the data comes from or is to be stored into, and the amount of data at each address. And with the start subchannel, the operation is passed off to the channel subsystem. The channel subsystem offloads a very important function from the host, and that's that of path selection. Architecturally, mainframe architecture supports up to eight paths across multiple FICON channels to a given logical storage control unit. And the channel subsystem selects the best path for each operation. So remember the E equals efficiency and is faster? The FICON architecture actually calls for a lot of measurements to be taken at each phase of an I.O. operation. So the channel subsystem has data available to it to allow it to make intelligent decisions in path selection, aimed at selecting the path that's going to most efficiently transfer the constructed I.U.s between the host and the storage control unit. After path selection is done, the selected channel is then going to translate the CCWs into fiber channel IUs. Those IUs contain an SB construct called a device information block. Remember that collection of organized data? That's how SB organizes it. It builds these device information blocks as part of the payload. And there are six types of these that are used in FICON command mode that are listed on the chart. Once the IUs are built, that's what's passed to the FC2 layer, and fiber channel frames are built from those IUs. Uh, going even lower, if there are buffer-to-buffer -buffer credits available for flow control, then the frames are sent on the link. Patty, I think one of the things that uh, uh, I find very interesting about the uh, mainframe is, in fact, the path selection function of the channel subsystem. Compared to many other um, solutions, this is one of the more robust uh, features of the mainframe. Uh, the ability to uh, distribute the load and then based upon the measurements determine which paths are going to be the most efficient for getting work done is unique to the mainframe. Uh, when you look at or compare it to other types of solutions, uh, they're very weak in this particular area and the channel has uh, characteristics that allows it to uh, not only determine when work is, is complete, how fast it's getting done, or if there are any problems with, uh, um, with the path that's, that's being used. Uh, furthermore, the uh, channel subsystem offloads the whole problem of determining if a particular path is, is uh, viable or um, continues to be prioritized. Then um, it passes it on up to, uh, up to the upper layer saying, hey, this path is either available or not available. The path group itself then it provides a level of redundancy um, that allows them to uh, um, lose a path, uh, restore a path, without any um, impact to the workload. Yeah, the, the channel subsystem is clearly a very powerful piece of the mainframe. <clears throat> so on this chart, I want to point out something special about FICON. So one noticeable difference between FICON command mode and the FCP protocol used by SCSI that many of you may be more familiar with is that FCP utilizes, as I tried to depict here, a single bi-directional fiber channel exchange between host initiator and storage or the target. However, with FICON, each I.O. operation uses two fiber channel exchanges. There's one unidirectional exchange for IUs that flow from the channel to the storage controller and a separate unidirectional exchange for IUs back from the storage controller to the channel. And that pair is what we commonly refer to as a FICON exchange.
Now, CCWs and their data from the system architecture layer are packaged into fiber channel IUs by the FICON link layer, and they do that following rules that are specified in the SB architecture. Lots of rules, but at a high level, each individual CCW command is packaged into an IU, and any subsequent CCWs in the chain each get their own IU. Um, following FCFS rules, the first IU that's sent for this CCW sequence, this channel program, will open an exchange between the sender and the receiver. Now, the maximum size of an IU is 8K. So if the CCW is right and it needs to transfer more data than will fit into that single IU along with the command, then additional IUs can be built to hold the remaining data, and as many as it takes to fulfill the data transfer. Uh, SB architecture does require something called a command response for the first command that the storage control unit receives, but I use for subsequent CCWs in the sequence can be sent without waiting for that response using a technique called pipelining. So we can stream a series of commands. And that's something unique to FICON, isn't it, Howard? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that ability to be able to uh, stream those commands provides a level of efficiency that's unmatched in other solutions. So let's look at how we, now we've gone from CCWs to IUs, how do we go from IUs to frames? And as we talk about the next step of converting the IUs into frames, it's helpful to have a reminder of what a fiber channel frame looks like. So that's what's depicted here in the middle of the chart. You can see the typical starter frame and end of frame deliver, delimiters at each end, um, and the FC2 header that provides control information, things like the R control and information categories I mentioned earlier, and lastly, a CRC, an FC2 level CRC that protects the integrity of the contents of that single frame. In between those pink areas is the green area new payload. And this is what's portrayed on the chart, is a high level description of how SB organizes that collection of data in that payload. You can see there are three major control blocks. There's an SB header, an IU header, and something called the device information block. And depending upon the type of DIB, remember we saw there could be six of them in command mode, um, the content varies. Not all of the fields depicted here may be up included in the payload. Looking at them individually, the SB header contains addressing information to identify the target logical path and device. The IU header uh, provide some SB control flags, including it'll tell you what kind of device information block follows. And it also contains information that helps associate an IU with a specific CCW. Remember I said data for a CCW could require multiple IUs to transfer it all. So there's a relationship uh, built in here. The device information block uh, contains a header and an LRC value. And then everything after that is optional depending upon the type of DIB and the conditions under which that particular DIB is being sent. Uh, if it transfers data, there is also included an SB, SBCRC that you see listed there. Both the LRC in the DIB and the SBCRC are there and they harken back to the I part of ISVAST or integrity. Uh, mainframes and hence FICON being a part of mainframes, are fanatical about this characteristic. <coughs> uh, each of the elements in a frame is a decomposition from a CCW to an IU down to a frame. And so these extra checks are to ensure the integrity of the steps in that decomposition process. Uh, the LRC inside the DIB provides an integrity check on the SB headers only. So that allows the storage controller to determine the header information is correct before it even attempts to do any processing with the data. The CRC is a running 32-bit uh, CRC that's contained in the last frame of each IU within the data transfer. Remember, it could have multiple um, IUs, could span multiple IUs, so it's an accumulated um, CRC value. And that CRC values there to help with the detection of missing or out of sequence frames or IUs. It's basically an FC4 level end-to-end -end protection. 
it lets the SB layer make sure that all the frames uh, that make up an IU were correctly received. Once the IU is built, the FC2 layer decomposes them into frames, fiber channel frames, uh, and that's where the FC2 CRC is then built and added to protect each individual frame. Uh, frames have a maximum size of 2112, so remember an IU could have up to 8K of data, so it may take multiple frames to transfer an IU and all of its data, but once that's done, operation complete. Patty, I think this is a, um, a really good point in what uh, makes the uh, mainframe quite a bit different in its transport relative to other protocols. The LRC, the SBCRC, and the CRC uh, all play a different role. And as you pointed out, uh, the FC2 CRC is just for transporting from point A to point B. Uh, the SB CRC is for protecting the entire um, data stream of the IU, and the LRC is for protecting the decomposition of the IU into the header information and the data field. Yep. Okay. So hopefully now you've gotten a picture of how FICON maps onto the fiber channel transport, how system architecture constructs like CCWs are translated to link level architecture constructs, IUs, and then to fiber channel transport constructs of frames. So now we're going to kind of move on and change subjects a bit, but keep trying to tie it back to what we've talked about up to this point. We'd like to talk a little bit about some of the evolutions in mainframe system architecture and FICON leak architecture that have occurred over time to keep the protocol living up to that. All the uh, characteristics or attributes of the is faster acronym. And the three things we're going to talk about today are persistent IU pacing, IDOS, MIDOS, and TIDOS, and something called transport mode. So before we dig in, Howard, anything you want to say about these topics? I think this is a, a, a good reflection of the evolution that we had talked about a little bit earlier, and that was from you know, each of the layers of mapping uh, FCSB protocol onto, the, um, uh, onto fiber channel. And we can see the evolution as we talk about, first of all, the IU pacing, uh, and then the um, IDOS, MIDOS, TIDOS uh, transition, which is really command mode to transport mode transition. Uh, all of these tie together uh, that continuing the, the idea that we want to make things more flexible, much more available, and high, uh, much more highly efficient, all while keeping integrity and security uh, part of the equation as well. So is faster, again, is underlined as one of the, the, uh, the key characteristics of the uh, fiber, uh, FICON transport. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is something called persistent IU pacing. But we're going to start by talking about something called default IU pacing. So fiber channel at the FC2 layer has excellent, in fact, what I'll declare is unmatched flow control capabilities. With things like buffer-to-buffer -buffer credits, a frame is only sent on a link to the sender when the sender knows in advance that the receiver has resource to receive it. Well, what about at the FC4 layer? Some level of flow control is needed at the higher level as well. Remember we described earlier, a FICON channel can stream or pipeline a series of commands and the associated data to a control unit without waiting for an FC4 level kind of acknowledgement or response to each command. We also described how these commands and the data are converted into IUs to be sent on the link. Well, FC4 floor con flow control for FICON uh, is done by, uh, there's a default value of the number of these IUs, generally the default value is 16, but this default value that of the IUs that can be sent on the link and active in the pipeline at any one time. And that's what we refer to as the IU pacing credit. Now in FICON, there's an IU type called the command response IU that is really an acknowledgement. It provides acknowledgement of receipt of commands. But a command response IU is not sent back for every command. Because we have that extensive checking process that we talked about in FICON, things like the CRC and the, and the DIV LRC, very few interlocked acknowledgements are actually required. 
So the way pacing works is the channel sets up, sends up to this IU pacing count number of IUs on the exchange, but it can set a bid on in one of them called the CRR bid or command response request bid. And the bid is generally set after sending about half or so of the IU pacing count number of IUs. And it says in effect to the control unit, tell me you've received up to this point. Now when the control unit responds with a command response that indicates, yep, I got to this point, then the channel knows that there are that many IUs less than the pacing count active in the pipe, because the, the control unit is saying, I already got this many. So it can send a bunch more IUs, of course, not to exceed the pacing count again. So that's default, how default pacing works. Now the pacing count has a default value, as I mentioned, but the control unit does have the ability to actually request a different IU pacing value. And you can imagine how at longer distances, you might want to exploit a higher value to keep that pipe active and um, optimize performance. But something to note about default IU pacing and any newly altered IU pacing value that the control unit says, oh, I, I can change the value to this, it's valid only for the duration of the exchange being active. So every time an exchange is opened, that, that the control unit has to identify, I can operate with a new value. So this evolved to something called persistent IU pacing. <clears throat> so with default IU pacing, the channel used that default value on the initiation of each exchange until the control unit set, received the first set of commands and sent the response that says, I want to use this new value. Now, if a control unit wants to use a higher value because it's physically located a distance away from the host processors, having to do that on each and every exchange isn't terribly efficient. Uh, once a control unit requests a new value for one exchange, with persistent IU pacing, now this new value is applied to all exchanges on that same logical path, that specific connection between the host and the control unit. And you can see how that improves efficiency because the channel can operate with this new modified value immediately every time it initiates a new exchange on that logical path. And that new value remains in effect until the path is reset or for whatever reason the control unit decides to change it again. Patty, I think this is a, uh, a great opportunity to kind of explain the, some of the experiences that I've had with, with uh, FICON. So as a, a, uh, in the development of various control unit solutions, uh, we've always referred to the channel as, as being able to, to uh, send data at us like a fire hose. Uh, and in this example that we've just gone through with the IU pacing, essentially what's going on is the channel is sending all this data, and then every now and then he says, hey, have you had enough? And the control unit can say, no, give me more. Or he can say, yeah, I've had enough, depending upon the uh, response to the CRR. Yep. The key thing is that the channel is able to keep the pipe filled. We're always pushing a lot of data or receiving a lot of data. Um, and that's what makes uh, uh, mainframe solutions very, very efficient for the types of high volume I.O. that uh, are required for uh, these applications. Right, and with pacing, particularly ex at extended distance performance at distance is key. Absolutely. So the next thing we're going to move to is to discuss a change related to the efficiency of data transfers. Um, IDOS, MIDOS, and TIDOS are enhancements that are made at the system architecture layer, but they're tightly, tightly coupled with how the system architecture layer is translated to the link architecture layer and, the FC, and then the FC2 transport layer and how efficient uh, that data transfer can be. So let's take a look at what these things do. So <clears throat> remember I.O. operations using the start sub channel instruction are used to transfer data to or from an I.O. device or to or from host main store. The channel program, the CCW sequence is what guides the transfer and it tells you how much data from where or to where in host memory to start retrieving or placing the data and the channel will then con begin to pull the data from that location or place the data into the location at the specified address in the CCW until the byte count is exhausted. 
what's key to realize is that channels use real storage addressing. So when data is to be placed into or pulled out of contiguous real storage, then a single CCW operation is very efficient. Take this many bytes from there. But device volumes have grown in capacity over time. So the chances that the larger amounts of data are likely to be in contiguous real host storage aren't very high. Um, hosts can, can, can obtain contiguous virtual storage, you know, more than a single page, but that's not the same as contiguous real. And the data for a single CCW, and here's a reminder of what the CCW looks like, uh, it, the data for it is sent or received contiguously from or to that single data address specified in CCW. If data isn't contiguous, then you need to use multiple CCWs. For example, write X bytes from address one, Y bytes from address two, et cetera. So having a means to pull the data from multiple real storage addresses and send it or receive it across the link contiguously in one or more densely packed IUs, because that's how it's going to flow, would increase efficiency. So the mainframe architecture had introduced a concept called indirect data address words. IDAWs provide a scatter-gather list type of function, but the downside of IDAWs is that they carry strict limitations on data addresses. The first address can start on any address boundary, but subsequent ones must start and end on a page boundary. So they must be contiguous. You see how this one starts somewhere and goes to the end of the page, and then two and three are full pages, and four is a partial. Um, you can see when data is placed in the contiguous virtual pages and, and it's all well behaved, each middle page is filled to the brim, then a single CCW operation that uses IDAWS, the scatter gather list, is very efficient. The channel is going to pull the data from each of those locations, or could reverse store it into, um, and all in a single operation, pack each IU to its AK capacity and send it. If the boundary rules for IDOS can be followed, this is a very efficient way to send or receive the larger amounts of data. But what about the case where the data is uh, in scattered storage locations, not, not all on those nice boundaries, and the amount of each scattered piece is not a full page? Maybe you have a little bit of here and then a larger amount. Well, mainframe architecture actually already handled that case. Pretty much from the beginning, it had this concept of chained data. And basically, you would have a CCW sequence, but not all of the CCWs would contain a new command. They would only contain a new address and count. And there would be a flag in the CCW that said, this is the case. This CCW is just chaining a new address and count to the prior one. And chain data had none of those IDA uh, boundary limits on the addresses. So you could actually move bits of data from random storage locations all in one field, well, using chain data. However, it's not terribly efficient. And the reason is each of the chain data CCWs is treated just the same as one that contains a new command. Remember the SBI, SB rules for packing? Uh, the CCWs into IUs, each one of those is sent separately. Each one is built into its own IU. That means its own SB header, IU header, DIB are built, lots of processing overhead on both the channel side building it and the storage side deconstructing it. So in the example on this chart where I have six non-contiguous storage areas, it would take six IUs to send these six distinct data segments to or from the device. That example um, where <coughs> we need to spend, send smaller amounts of data from these non-contiguous random boundary real storage locations is actually pretty common in mainframe device architecture the extended count key data stuff we referred to earlier. So to handle this case, MIDAs were created. And they delivered the flexibility of chain data, the relaxed uh, boundary rules and count rules, but with the efficiency that IDAs provide. 
So in essence, MIDAWs give you a scatter-gather list of addresses and counts with the relaxed boundary rules. So the data can be fetched from, by the channel as one contiguous blob into the, from the individual addresses provided for the counts provided. And as with IDAWs, the channel can fetch this data from various storage locations and package it into a minimal number of IUs sent, to be sent across the link, increasing the efficiency. On a read, the, re, the reverse is true. It can request that the contiguous blob be sent from the device, send me this amount of data, but it can store it into the scattered storage locations that are uh, provided by the MIDAW list. So a single CCW operation using MIDAW is very efficient. There's minimal overhead. So this idea of, of IDAWs versus chain data versus MIDAWs uh, is an example of how system architecture, because these are all defined in system architecture, not actually in SB, but they follow the SBI rules for packaging into IUs. And so it has an effect on the efficiency of what flows on the link. The third and last item that we're going to introduce today is something called transport mode. So up to this point, as I've described how things work, I've often qualified my statements with using the phrase in FICON command mode. And I've made that distinction because one of the largest and most recent changes, it's been a number of years, but one of the largest and most recent changes that occurred in FICON was the addition of something we call transport mode. And it changed a lot about how operations uh, between the host and the storage control unit are handled. So that's what I'm going to begin to talk about now. We'll start again with a quick review of command mode. Uh, a start subchannel points to an operation request block. The operation request block points to a chain or a sequence of commands and associated data to be transferred. The data, as we just talked about can be, the address can be pointed to by the CCW itself um, or a chain data CCW or by an IDAW list or a MIDAW list. And most importantly, as we've stated, each CCW or pseudo chain data CCW is sent on the link individually. The goal of transport mode was to improve the execution performance of FICON CCW chains. Transport mode reduces the overhead for FICON on small block transfers, and it does so without actually adding or moving the overhead anywhere else. In command mode, channels must build separate IUs for each command, and the control unit must dissect them individually, as we talked about on the other end of the link. And you can see a sample uh, CCW, command mode CCW chain shown here, how much chit chat there is on the link uh, for the completion of this <coughs> CCW chain. FICON transport mode was created to simplify the link protocol as well as take advantage of some of the FCP hardware assist that exist in many vendor adapters. And it did this by exploiting the FCP link transport protocol. Now, when you hear FCP, you may think SCSI because SCSI is, in fact, the largest exploiter of FCP, but the two are not really equivalent. In fact, the newest uh, fiber channel uh, upper level protocol, FC NVMe, that many of you may have heard of, it also uses this scheme of exploiting the FCP protocol and those hardware accelerations in vendor adapters to transport NVMe operations over fiber channel. So FICON did it first with uh, transport mode, but it's also the same philosophy used in FC NVMe. So with transport mode, the idea is to do more work with one control word by collapsing what I'm going to refer to as well-behaved CCW strings into a single new control word. And this control word points to a series of commands and associated data, and that's what's packaged into IU so it can be sent over to the control unit in one or a minimal number of IUs to increase that efficiency on the link. 
Uh, remember earlier we talked about how MIDAS allow typical chain data CCWs to be collapsed into one CCW with data just gathered from various locations. Transport mode allows the collapsing of entire command strings of both command chain and data chain CCWs into one control word called a transport control word. The data transfer count of this new control word can also be significantly larger than smaller byte count limit for heritage mode uh, CCW architecture. The one thing of note on this chart is that Channel and controller support for transport mode is exchanged during an inkli initial link initialization, <laughs> but transport mode is simply an extension to the existing FICON link architecture. It's not a replacement for it. So channels that have been enhanced with transport mode or control units that have been enhanced with transport mode will all execute existing heritage command mode CCW chains. But newer channel programs can generate the new control words. Um, and I'll say where appropriate. Remember I talked about well-behaved chains. There are fi some FICON CCW constructs that don't currently convert well to transport mode. So a, and any individual FICON channel may send some operations using transport mode and other operations using command mode simultaneously. Hey, Patty, I think one of the things that um, you've really pointed out here is the um, backwards compatibility that the um, mainframe, uh, and in this case, the transport has uh, with all of its previous implementations. Uh, you know, one of the key things that we talked about in the FICON 101 um, session was the fact that uh, programs written, you know, 40, 50 years ago can still run on, on the mainframes of today. Uh, and this is another example of where that backwards compatibility also comes in, into play. You know, even at the I.O. level, we're able to execute uh, CCW programs that were built uh, understanding just command mode and execute them with, with both uh, you know, new channels and, and new devices as well as old channels and old devices um, while adding on the, these uh, greater capabilities of, of uh, transport mode that you're covering now. Exactly. I think it's important that you know it has the ability. The mainframe has the ability to move on, move, keep up with times, move faster, do things more efficiently, and yet maintain that legacy uh, ability to support legacy applications. Um, it's one of the harder things uh, to do, but uh, so far so good. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's uh, a very key point in that uh, it is difficult to make sure that uh, what you're building new is compatible with what you've already done. Exactly. So kind of looking at uh, transport mode as we had done for command mode. A transport mode operation starts exactly the same way as a command mode operation. That same start subchannel instructions issued by the processor passing in the operation request block. What's different and what you see here is there's a new bit defined in this ORB that identifies that the control block that the channel's about to fetch is now something called a TCW. So the OR points to, instead of a CCW, it points to a TCW. And the TCW provides the pointers then for the channel for all of the control blocks required to issue, to execute the, the IO operation. The entire channel program, the list of commands and data, is packaged here in these device control words into a new construct called the Transport Command and Control Block, the TCCB. And the TCCB, along with a couple of other headers, is what's sent to the control unit in the equivalent of an FCP command descriptor block. With this method of transporting CCW chains to a control unit, the entire link transport protocol is then offloaded from the channel engine to the FCP HBA. Um, earlier we talked about uh, the scatter gather list uh, constructs called IDAWs and MIDAWs, and the title also included TIDAWs. Well, I couldn't really talk about it, talk about them until I talked about transport mode here. But you can see in transport mode, we do have a similar IDA, MIDA, uh, more like MIDA construct called TIDAS. But TIDAS are even a little different than MIDAS in that they permit a TCW to specify transfer of all the data from non-contiguous blocks in main store 
or to specify the TCCB may be comprised, uh, it may be assembled from non-contiguous blocks of storage, or actually both of those things. Um, there are other efficiency advantages of packaging the entire CCW string and sending it over to the control unit in one fell swoop. Um, if you are familiar with the concept of device reserve and release protocols um, used for multi-system sharing of a single device, well, this is improved with transport mode operations by allowing we send over the whole pile of commands to the control unit, and that allows the commands to remain queued inside the control unit when the device is reserved to another operating system. So that eliminates the need for the channel to be told about that reserve condition and then have to retransmit the data when the device is no longer busy. Uh, it also makes it easier for the control unit to control fairness among the sharing systems once the device is released. So a lot of efficiencies built into transport mode. So <clears throat> I mentioned before about MDME using it too, and I said it's very much it, SCSI is the main user of FCP. And so what I wanted to do was kind of put side by side um, a, how SCSI and SB or FICON uh, map uh, to, the, to an FCP command IU. Um, now, it, it's not really the same totally as a FCP command IU. It's not really FCP. It's not really SCSI. Uh, some bits and bytes are set uh, per the FCP protocol in common with what's done in SCSI. Uh, th that allows the host bus adapters to work in FCP mode uh, with transport mode for optimal performance so we can take advantage of those accelerations they have. But if you have a device or a trace tool that's looking or tracking something at the FC4 layer, uh, it's not going to look like anything they know until they understand the transport mode FC4 layer. So looking at these two side by side, how SCSI and FICON transport mode build the command IU, hopefully you can see some similarities. Um, the first eight bytes are addressing information. They identify the target of the operation. In SCSI, it's a LUN. In SB, it's the SB header information that we talked about. Followed by some control information. And then in the command descriptive block area, the work that needs to be performed is described. And that's where that series of commands, our TCCB, is placed. <coughs> um, it's interesting to note that these are similarities in FC NVMe as well. Uh, so for those of you who are familiar with that, the addressing area uh, for NVMe contains the NVMe connection identifier. And then that area describing the work to be performed is contains an NVMe submission queue element. So commonality in using the FCP transport here. The next chart kind of shows that efficiency. So it takes that CCW chain that I had shown on a prior chart, and you can see how much less chatty on the link a transport command mode operation is than that exact same operation executed um, using command mode versus transport mode constructs. With transport mode, there are many fewer IUs. There are many fewer sequences, many fewer frames. Um, it is also worth noting, because we talked about it earlier, that a transport mode operation uses a single bidirectional fiber channel exchange just like FCP SCSI does, as opposed to that FICON exchange pair that I described earlier we utilize in command mode. So I hope that you enjoyed diving a little bit deeper into FICON today. Uh, have a little bit better sense of how FICON uh, as an upper level protocol maps onto the fi fiber channel transport and some evolutions in the protocol that were, have been aimed at increasing the efficiency of the transactions, all the while maintaining that fanatical focus on integrity. So, Howard, some final words? Yes, Patty, I think uh, it was really wonderful today to uh, kind of learn about uh, several things. Uh, uh, about uh, the mainframe and about FICON in general. First, we started with the characteristics of the mainframe, which was part of our review. Integrity, security,
flexibility, availability, serviceability, transactions, efficiency, and reliability. That was our is faster mnemonic. The next thing that we learned about, or certainly I learned about, was uh, the uh, application of FICON to, to fiber channel. Um, we learned that uh, the first SB protocol was SCON, and then we began mapping FICON SB2 um, command mode onto fiber channel. We added IU pacing, uh, and then we developed the concept of transport mode, all of which were elements that improved the efficiency uh, of FICON. We also learned today that there is uh, a, a lot about integrity involved in building or decomposing FICON IUs for transport across a fiber channel network. And that's where we saw, I'm calling it CRCs galore, an LRC, an SBCRC, and an SC2 CRC. Let's just say FICON is fanatical about being uh, highly, highly redundant and, highly, uh, and having high integrity. IU pacing was for distance. IDAs, MIDAs, and TIDAs were all about getting more efficient, and transport mode was about how to reduce the chatter. So lots of great topics today, Patty. Thank you so much uh, for bringing us up to date in our FICON 201 uh, webinar today. Uh, thanks for all your help, F Howard, and sharing the time with me. So, Joe, I guess we are uh, have a little time left if there are any questions. Um, we didn't receive any questions online, but if you think of them, go ahead and send them to the FCI org. Um, moving along, our next FCI webcast is uh, Protocol Analysis 201. Again, this is the second in a series for High Speed Fiber Channel. It's on April 11th at 10. You can register at brightdoc.com. Um, after this webcast, if you would please rate the event. We value your feedback. The more you give us feedback, the more we can improve it and answer uh, and make them better and better for you guys. You can follow us on Twitter at FCIA.news. You can also uh, look at our library. We have a tremendous amount of on-demand webcasts, whether it's Fiber Channel Fundamentals, FCN VME, all the way down to Fiber Channel Cabling and 64 gig. With that, I would like to say uh, thank you very much and that we hope you found this uh, seminar educational and you'll be able to use it in your data center. I'd like to thank you again, and please look for additional information on fiberchannelorg.website. Thank you, and everyone have a good day. The end.